Greetings, my name is Stan Prager from the Regarp book blog at regarp.com. Today's podcast features my review of The Reopening of the Western Mind, The Resurgence of Intellectual Life from the End of Antiquity to the Dawn of the Enlightenment by Charles Freeman. Nearly two decades have passed since Charles Freeman published The Closing of the Western Mind, The Rise of Faith and the Fall of Reason, a brilliant if controversial examination of the intellectual totalitarianism of Christianity that dated to the dawn of its dominance of Rome and the successor states that followed the fragmentation of the empire in the West. Freeman argued persuasively that the early Christian church vehemently and often brutally rebuked the centuries-old classical tradition of philosophical inquiry and ultimately drove it to extinction, with a singular intolerance of competing ideas crushed under the weight of a monolithic faith. Not only were pagan religions prohibited, but there would be virtually no provision for any dissent with official Christian doctrine, such that those who advanced even the most minor challenges to interpretation were branded heretics and sent to exile or put to death. That tragic state was to define medieval Europe for more than a millennium. Now the renowned classical historian has returned with a follow-up epic, the reopening of the Western mind, the resurgence of intellectual life from the end of antiquity to the dawn of the Enlightenment, a revised and repolished version of The Awakening, a history of the Western mind, A.D. 500 to 1700, previously published in the U.K., which recounts the slow some might brand it glacial, evolution of Western thought that restored legitimacy to independent examination and analysis, and that eventually led to a celebration, albeit a cautious one, of reason over blind faith. In the process, Freeman reminds us that quality, engaging narrative history has not gone extinct, while demonstrating that it is possible to produce a work that is so well written, it is readable by a general audience, while meeting the rigorous standards of scholarship demanded by academia. That this is no small achievement will be evident to anyone who, as I do, reads both popular and scholarly history and is struck by the stultifying prose that often typifies the academic. In contrast, here Freeman takes a skillful pen to reveal people, events, and occasionally obscure concepts, much of which may be unfamiliar to those who are not well versed in the medieval period. Full Disclosure Charles Freeman and I began a long correspondence via email following my review of Closing. I was honored when he selected me as one of his readers for his Drafts of Awakening, the earlier UK edition of this work, which he shared with me in 2018. But at the same time, I approached this responsibility with some trepidation. Given Freeman's credentials and reputation, what if I found the work to be substandard? What if it was simply not a good book? How would I address that? As it was, these worries turned out to be misplaced. It is a magnificent book and I am grateful to have read much of it as a work in progress, and then again after publication. I did submit several pages of critical commentary to assist the author, to the best of my limited abilities, hone a better final product, and to that end, I am proud to see my name appear in the acknowledgments. But to be clear, I am an independent reviewer, and did not receive compensation for this review. The fall of Rome remains a subject of debate for historians. While traditional notions of sudden collapse given to pillaging vandals leaping over city walls and fora engulfed in flames have long been revised, competing visions of a more gradual transition that better reflect the scholarship sometimes distort the historiography to minimize both the fall and what was actually lost. And what was lost was indeed dramatic and incalculable. If, to take just one example, sanitation can be said to be a mark of civilization, the Roman aqueducts and complex network of sewers that fell into disuse and disrepair meant that fresh water was no longer reliable, and sewage that bred pestilence was to be the norm for 15 centuries to follow. It was not until the late 19th century that sanitation in Europe even approached Roman standards. So whatever the timeline, rapid or gradual, there was indeed a marked collapse. Causes are far more elusive. But Gibbon's largely discredited casting of Christianity as the villain that brought the empire down tends to raise hackles in those who suspect someone like Freeman attempting to point those fingers once more. But Freeman has nothing to say about why Rome fell, only what followed. The loss of the pursuit of reason was to be as devastating for the intellectual health of the post-Roman world in the West as sanitation was to prove for his physical health. And here Freeman does squarely take aim at the institutional Christian church as the proximate cause for the subsequent consequences for Western thought. This is well underscored in the bleak assessment that follows in one of the final chapters in the closing of the Western mind. Christian thought that emerged in the early centuries often gave irrationality the status of a universal truth to the exclusion of those truths to be found through reason. So the uneducated was preferred to the educated and the miracle to the operation of natural laws. 
This reversal of traditional values became embedded in the Christian tradition. Intellectual self-confidence and curiosity, which lay at the heart of the Greek achievement, were recast as the dreaded sin of pride. Faith and obedience to the institutional authority of the church were more highly rated than the use of reasoned thought. The inevitable result was intellectual stagnation. Reopening picks up where closing leaves off, but the new work is marked by far greater optimism. Rather than dwell on what has been lost, Freeman puts focus not only upon the recovery of concepts long forgotten, but how rediscovery eventually sparked new original thought, as the spiritual and later increasingly secular world danced warily around one another, with a burning heretic all too often staked between them on Europe's fraught intellectual ballroom. Because the timeline is so long, encompassing 12 centuries, the author sidesteps what could have been a dull chronological recounting of this slow progression to narrow his lens upon select people, events, and ideas that collectively marked milestones on the way, which comprised thematic chapters to broaden the scope. This approach thus transcends what might have been otherwise parochial to brilliantly convey the panoramic. There are many superlative chapters in reopening, including the very first one, entitled The Saving of the Texts, 500 to 750. Freeman seems to delight in detecting the bits and pieces of the classical universe that managed to survive not only the vigorous attempts by early Christians to erase pagan thought, but the unintended ravages of deterioration that is every archivist's nightmare. Ironically, the sacking of cities in ancient Mesopotamia begat conflagrations that baked inscribed clay tablets, preserving them for millennia. No such luck for the Mediterranean world, where papyrus scrolls, the favorite medium for text, fell to war, natural disasters, deliberate destruction, as well as to entropy, a familiar byproduct of the second law of thermodynamics, which was not kind in prevailing environmental conditions. We are happily still discovering papyri preserved by the dry conditions in parts of Egypt, the oldest dating back to 2500 BCE, but it seems that the European climate doomed papyrus to a scant 200 years before it was no more. Absent printing presses or digital scans, texts were preserved by painstakingly copying them by hand, typically onto vellum, a kind of parchment made from animal skins with a long shelf life, most frequently in monasteries by monks for whom literacy was deemed essential. But what to save? The two giants of ancient Greek philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, were preserved, but the latter far more grudgingly. Fledgling concepts of empiricism in Aristotle made the medieval mind uncomfortable. Plato, on the other hand, who pioneered notions of imaginary higher powers and perfect forms, could be, albeit somewhat awkwardly, adapted to the prevailing faith in the Trinity, and thus elements of Plato were syncretized into Christian orthodoxy. Of course, as we celebrate what was saved, it is difficult not to likewise mourn what was lost to us forever. Fortunately, the Arab world put a much higher premium on the preservation of classical texts, an especially eclectic collection that included not only metaphysics but geography, medicine, and mathematics. When centuries later, as Freeman highlights in reopening, these works reached Europe, they were to be instrumental as tinder to the embers that were to spark first a revival and then a revolution in science and discovery. My favorite chapter in reopening is Abelard and the Battle for Reason which chronicles the extraordinary story of scholastic scholar Peter Abelard, who flirted with the secular and attempted to connect rationalism with theology, told against the flamboyant backdrop of Abelard's tragic love affair with Heloise, a tale that yet remains the stuff of popular culture. In a fit of pique, Heloise's father was to have Abelard castrated. The church attempted something similar, metaphorically, with Abelard's teachings, which led to an order of excommunication, later lifted, but despite official condemnation, Abelard left a dramatic mark on European thought that long lingered. There was too much material in a volume this thick to cover competently in a review, but the reader will find much of it well worth the time. Of course, some will be drawn to certain chapters more than others. Art historians will no doubt be taken with the one entitled The Flowering of the Florentine Renaissance, which for me harkened back to the best elements of Kenneth Clark's civilization, showcasing not only the evolution of European architecture, but the author's own adulation for both the art and the engineering feat demonstrated by Brunelleschi's Dome, the extraordinary 15th century adornment that crowns the Florence Cathedral. Of course, Freeman does temper his praise for such achievements with juxtaposition to what once had been, 
as in a later chapter that recounts the process of relocating an ancient Egyptian obelisk weighing 331 tons that had been placed on the Vatican Hill by the Emperor Caligula, which was seen as remarkable at the time. In a footnote, Freeman reminds us that one might talk of 16th century technological miracles, but the obelisk had been successfully erected by the Egyptians, taken down by the Romans, brought by sea to Rome, and then re-erected there, all the while remaining intact. If I was to find a fault with reopening, is that it does not, in my opinion, go far enough to emphasize the impact of the Columbian experience on the reopening of the Western mind. There is a terrific chapter devoted to the topic, which explores how the discovery of the Americas and its exotic inhabitants compelled the European mind to examine other human societies whose existence had never before even been contemplated. While that is a valid avenue for analysis, it yet hardly takes into account just how earth-shattering 1492 turned out to be, arguably the most consequential milestone for human civilization and the biosphere since the first cities appeared in Sumer in a myriad of ways, not least the exchange of flora and fauna and microbes that accompanied it. But this significance was perhaps greatest for Europe, which had been a backwater, long eclipsed by China and the Arab Middle East. It was the Colombian experience that reoriented the center of the world, so to speak, from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, which was exploited to the fullest by the Europeans who prowled those seas and first bridged the continents. It is difficult to imagine the subsequent accomplishments, intellectual and otherwise, had Columbus not landed at San Salvador. But this remains just a quibble that does not detract from Freeman's overall accomplishment. Interest in the medieval world has perhaps waned over time, but that is of course a mistake. How we got from point A to point B is an important story, even if it has never been told before as well as Freeman has told it in reopening. And it is not an easy story to tell. As the author acknowledges in a concluding chapter, bringing together the many different elements that led to the reopening of the Western mind is a challenge. It is important to stress just how bereft Europe was economically and culturally after the fall of the Roman Empire compared to what it had been before. Those of us given to dystopian fiction, concerned with the fragility of republics and civilization, and perhaps wondering aloud in the midst of an ongoing global pandemic and the rise of authoritarianism what our descendants might recall of us if it all fell to collapse tomorrow, cannot help but be intrigued by how our ancestors coped, for better or for worse, after Rome was no more. If you want to learn more about that, there might be no better covers to crack than Freeman's The Reopening of the Western Mind. I highly recommend it. Thank you for joining me for today's podcast. I encourage you to download it and share it in your network. Many more reviews on an eclectic array of fiction and nonfiction books are available at regarp.com and regarpbookblogpod.com. Have a great day.